Hello, welcome, and thank you for being part of WorkSafe's Scheme Modernization Webinar. My name is Chris McKenzie, your host for the session, and joining me on today's panel, we have Rania Shawan, who's WorkSafe's Director of Legislation, Policy, and Information Services. Good morning, Rania. Hi, Chris. Good morning, everyone. Jason Lardelli, who is WorkSafe's Executive Director of Return to Work Victoria. Hi, Jason. Morning, Chris. Good to be with you. And Simon Norgate, who is WorkSafe's Director of Claims. G'day, Simon. Hi, Chris. Welcome, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. So let's remind ourselves why we are here today. On the 31st of March, a number of government changes came into effect to modernise the work cover scheme to ensure it remains sustainable and can continue to support injured Victorian workers into the future. This webinar will be an opportunity to hear from WorkSafe experts about the changes. And we're going to cover off why the changes have been made, what the key changes are and the types of claims that may be impacted and the additional supports available for those who are impacted by the changes. We're then going to open it up for audience questions via the Q&A chat box on the right hand side of your screen. Remember you are welcome to enter your questions anytime from now so we do have them ready when it comes to the Q&A part of the session. So just a few housekeeping matters before we get started. Today is providing an overview of the changes to you and what this means to you. Unfortunately, we are unable to respond to hypotheticals or specific scenarios or provide you with any specific legal advice. This webinar will be recorded and modified for online viewing via our website. And remember, there is plenty of information regarding the scheme also available on WorkSafe's website. So let's get straight into it. Jason, we might kick it off with you first. Could you tell us a little bit about why the changes were needed to modernise the work cover scheme? Thanks, Chris. So WorkSafe was established back in 1985 uh, and primarily established to deal with physical injuries. Um, today, WorkSafe is, is facing the biggest financial challenge uh, in its history. Um, also, today's injuries are different from when the scheme was originally designed. Um, with significant increases in mental injuries, uh, as well as people staying on the scheme uh, for much longer. So it's fair to say that the scheme today is no longer fit for purpose and has become uh, unsustainable. Um, but it's, it's clear that urgent change is needed um, to ensure that we can continue to support uh, injured workers here in Victoria, uh, also to help meet our claims liabilities uh, and to improve return to work outcomes um, for the best recovery uh, outlook. Rania, I might bring you in now. Uh, Jason mentioned there the increase in mental injury claims and the impact that this has had on the work cover scheme recently. Could you tell us a little bit more about that, please? Sure. So just to build on what Jason was saying, when the scheme commenced, mental injuries only accounted for around 2% of claims. But over time, with increasing understanding and awareness of workplace mental health across the community and more broadly, it has meant that people are seeking um, more support from across community and health services and workers' compensation schemes. So mental injury now accounts for around 16% of claims, and this is expected to grow um, annually by around 5.5% until the end of 2030. The cost of mental injury claims are also um, higher than physical injury claims, with a mental injury claim costing on average around $280,000, which is actually more than double a physical injury claim at around $125,000. And we know the that due to the complexity of mental health conditions, it's, it means that more people are staying on the scheme for longer. And there is also a growing tendency for workers to rely on the workers' compensation scheme for support even though their work may not be the sole or most significant cause of that condition. And capturing those incidents goes beyond the purpose of the workers' compensation scheme. Um, historically, claims and eligibility assessment measures are more aligned to physical injuries. And without the reform to address these challenges, the scheme would not have been sustainable. Simon, bringing you in now, if workers with a mental injury are staying on the work cover scheme longer, I assume that means they're not getting back to work as soon either. Yeah, that's correct, Chris. And um, as Jason and Rania did refer to, um, workers with mental injuries uh, um, you know, have significantly worse outcomes and poorer return to work. 
um, than those with a physical injury. So a worker with a mental injury, um, you know, 45% uh, of workers with mental injury get back to work within six months versus 75% for physical um, injury. So there's a stark difference there in relation to um, uh, the outcomes that um, injured workers are able to achieve. So they also require more weekly payments and associated expenses um, with their claim. And, and really it's acknowledged that um, getting back to work um, earlier after an injury can be good for an injured worker's health um, and well-being. That makes sense. Thanks, Simon. Uh, Jason, coming back to you now. So what are the changes that the government has made to modernise the work cover scheme? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Well, there have been a number of changes introduced under the Work Cover uh, Scheme Modernisation Act, which commenced on the 31st of March uh, this year, 2024. Um, and to help explain this, there were two major changes um, that the, uh, to the Work Cover Scheme. Um, up front, a new eligibility requirement for all mental injury claims. And at the back end, an additional whole person impairment requirement uh, for workers to continue to receive weekly payments after the 130 week second entitlement period. Um, there were also some other supporting changes, uh, primarily to improve the way that the scheme operates uh, and to make sure that we can be effective uh, with the reforms. This includes um, the establishment of a return to work advisory committee um, which is to provide advice to the WorkSafe board uh, on the return to work initiatives that are being uh, considered. Um, also that an independent review of the changes uh, introduced under the Scheme Modernization uh, Act uh, to be conducted in 2027 by a panel of experts. Um, and as well as these changes, um, we've also established Return to Work Victoria uh, which will focus on providing all the necessary supports uh, to help expedite injured workers' recovery, rehabilitation, and safe return to work. Thanks, Jason, for that overview of the changes. So we are focusing today on those two key changes. Uh, Simon, coming back to you, could you please take us through the new whole person impairment requirements and, and, and what that means for injured workers? No worries, Chris. Um, so, so a worker who's in receipt of weekly payments um, prior to the 130-week um, point um, have their ongoing entitlement assessed. Um, and so this is really called the um, expiry of the second entitlement period. Um, and as part of this review, there will now be two um, assessments done. Um, the first one being the existing assessment of the worker's capacity for work. And then there'll be a new whole person impairment assessment, so commonly known as the WPI assessment. And so this WPI assessment is to determine the amount of permanent damage a worker has as a result of their injury. Um, and this assessment is undertaken by an independent, independent impairment assessor, or commonly known as an IAA, um, and only workers um, with 21% or more whole person impairment and also satisfying the incapacity test will be entitled to ongoing payments post the expiry of 130 weeks. So Simon, what does happen to a worker who's assessed as having a whole person impairment or WPI of less than 21%, for example? So, so workers that are assessed as below 21% um, whole person impairment will um, not continue to be eligible for weekly payments after 130 weeks. So a 13-week a notice period um, will continue to be required prior to ceasing any um, payments um, to an injured worker. But these workers can still access other supports. So those other supports um, are um, psychosocial supports, um, occupational rehab supports, including um, retraining and um, exploration of suitable employment options with an alternative employer, um, as well as um, reasonable medical-like expenses that will continue post that 130-week stage. That's good to know there is support still available, Simon. Just one more on this topic, if we can. How will workers know if they need to have their WPI assessed? So good question, Chris. So not all workers are impacted by these changes. So this will only apply to an injured worker that reaches 130 weeks of paid payable compensation on or after the 31st of March. So if a worker's claim is impacted, um, WorkSafe or their agent will send them a letter 
um, with more information around what these changes mean to them and also what um, additional supports are available um, uh, through that process. Rania, coming to you now, and let's move on to the other major change. Could you please explain for our audience what the differences will be for mental injury claim eligibility? Yep. Sure. So there are really three key changes to mental injury eligibility. Previously, there was no definition of a mental injury and the reforms have introduced a definition. So a men mental injury is now going to be defined as one that causes significant behavioural, cognitive or psychological dysfunction. And it has to be diagnosed by a medical practitioner in accordance with the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which are called the DSM, which is essentially a, a manual for diagnosing mental um, illness. A mental injury must meet that definition in order to be eligible for compensation. I'll just jump in there, Rania. What does uh, significant dysfunction actually mean? Yeah. Um, so a mental injury must significantly inf interfere with a worker's life. Medical practitioners already consider the degree in which a person's ability to function is affected by a mental health condition, and that's been um, happening currently and previously. These definition um, will help to embed that process and identify the injuries most in need of support and compensation for time off work. Psychological reactions, which are short term in nature and do not interfere with a worker's function or do not result in a formal diagnosis, would not meet the new definition. Other than that uh, new definition, what else has changed for mental injury eligibility? Yeah, so the remaining changes relate to entitlement to compensation. Once you've established or work has established that a mental injury exists um, that meets the new definition, then entitlement to compensation will be assessed. The reforms um, now require that the mental injuries are predominantly caused by work. So that is employment must be the strongest or single largest contributing cause of a worker's mental injury for it to be eligible for compensation. Mental injuries are complex and often a result of a cumulative impact of several events. But these changes um, strengthen the link between employment and the mental injury uh, to ensure that they remain compensable. There is also a new exclusion for stress and burnout. Workers won't be eligible for compensation where a mental injury is caused by stress or burnout as a result of events considered usual or typical and expected in the role. There are, of course, exemptions to that in that stress and burnout caused by bullying and harassment will remain compensable or stress or burnout resulting from traumatic events considered usual or typical and reasonably expected in the role will also remain compensable so long as you've met the initial uh, mental injury definition. Similarly, if you've been exposed to a one-off traumatic event and it's predominantly caused by work, then that mental injury, um, as defined, will also remain compensable. I think this is a question that many in the audience would be wanting to ask, apart from those exclusions, why has the government decided to exclude stress and burnout from compensation? So um, we know that most jobs involve a degree of work-related stress and that this um, can vary depending on the industries. Um, individuals respond to stress in different ways and in some cases stress can be a motivating factor. Stress and burnout are psychological responses and not all will result in a formal mental health um, condition or disorder. Previously, there was no test that would differentiate short-term response to stresses or to those that resulted in a medical diagnosis. And as I mentioned earlier, the changes ensure that the scheme supports the most significant mental injuries. Um, it's also really important to highlight that continuing that there is a continuing obligation um, that employers have to ensure the prevention of overwork, unreasonable job demands or other hazards and risks to mental health under the health and safety legislation. So these changes to the workers' compensation scheme do not in any way lessen an employer's obligation to prevent risks to health and safety in any way. I think that's a really important point. Thank you, Rania. Um, and just in relation to those exclusions for when stress and burnout are still compensable, what do we mean by a traumatic event? Yeah, so um, traumatic events are ones that you consider to be emotionally shocking events, likely to cause fear or distress, reasonably expected to cause psychological harm. It may involve exposure or actual um, exposure to a traumatic incident like physical abuse any threat of physical harm or actual physical harm. Um, and examples of, of um, I guess, occupations that would be exposed to traumatic events quite often would be ambulance workers, um, nurses, lawyers, that sort of thing. 
lawyers who are exposed to you know, tra traumatic pictures in their work, that kind of thing. Thanks, Rania. That makes sense. Uh, do those changes on mental injury eligibility apply to all mental injury work cover claims? So, no, it's only those that um, apply to claims where the mental injury occurred on or after the 31st of March 2024, um, and it won't apply to mental injury claims that have already been accepted prior to that date. Great. Thanks, Rania. Simon, we might bring you back in now. Um, this one's, I think, more in your area. What supports are available to those workers who might not no longer be eligible for mental injury compensation? Thanks, Chris. Uh, we, we do know that um, with these changes, early treatment and support is important um, to provide greater chance of recovery for an injured worker. Um, all workers will be continued to be eligible for provisional payments until a claim is accepted, or alternatively, if that claim is rejected, up to a maximum of 13 weeks. Um, and I do want to highlight that these changes in no way will impact a worker's entitlement to provisional payments. Um, and provisional payments are there to support and help um, cover the reasonable costs of treatment um, to, to, to really enhance opportunities for recovery. And, and this is including um, appointments with the GP, psychologist, psychiatrist or counsellor, um, medication that an injured worker may need um, following an injury, as well as um, facilitated discussion, which is a really important um, service to support um, both injured workers and employers in breaking down the um, barriers to um, recovery and return to work. Uh, Jason, coming back to you now, um, if people are looking for some more information and some detailed information on the changes and how they might be impacted, uh, where can they go? Yeah, thanks, Chris. So <clears throat> the first port of call will be our, our website, which is um, worksafe.vic.gov.au backslash scheme modernisation. There you'll find information sheets, on the changes to mental injury eligibility um, and whole person impairment. Uh, there'll be practice directives uh, at, to assist decision makers, including independent medical examiners, self-insurers, agents, uh, in how to apply the changes. Um, there's also some short animations about the changes there as well. So um, there will also be further tools and information um, on the page over time, uh, including the recording of, um, of today's webinar. And, and we mentioned earlier that alongside these changes, WorkSafe has established Return to Work Victoria to focus on providing the necessary supports to help injured workers recover, rehabilitate and get back safely to work. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about Return to Work Victoria, Jason? Yeah, sure, Chris. Thanks. So Return to Work Victoria was established on the 31st of March this year, 2024, um, with the priority of helping injured workers recover and return to work um, safely and, and without delay. Um, return to Work Victoria will focus on promoting uh, effective occupational rehabilitation of, of injured workers, um, also uh, serving to encourage employers to provide suitable job opportunities uh, for workers uh, who have been injured, um, as well as identifying um, innovative injury prevention and return to work uh, strategies. Um, it will also serve to deliver the government's commitment to create uh, and trial these new programs um, and initiatives in order to uh, prevent workplace injury and improve return to work outcomes. Um, and what we've done at WorkSafe is we've served to uh, centralize all of the claims management, the recovery and return to work functions within a single entity uh, at, within WorkSafe, um, enabling us to better target uh, and support uh, the interventions. Um, these changes will mean that Victorian workers will continue to receive the help um, that they need when they need it, um, and also making sure that employers get the right support in order to help keep uh, their workers safe. Thank you, Jason, and thanks, Rania, Simon and Jason, for giving us an overview and some details on these important changes to the work cover scheme. Uh, it is not surprising that we already have plenty of questions coming through from the audience. So let's start to go through them now. Just a reminder, you can post your question at any time on in the Q&A chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. Keep them coming through as we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. 
Um, let's go to the first question now. Um, coming through, so a question I think for you, Jason, might be difficult to put a time frame on it, but the question is with these changes being made and now in effect, how long until the work cover scheme becomes sustainable again? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Great question. Um, these schemes are, uh, are complex um, and can take time to, um, to put in place the, the, the recovery that we need. Um, but typically, it, we're talking about years, not months. Um, but the focus that we are taking on this is, is to bring us to a stable position. And then from a stable position, we can then move to a sustainable position. Uh, and so uh, in my mind, I have a view of about 18 to 24 months will help us to bring about some stability. Um, and then from there, we, we should be able to be in a very sustainable uh, period of time. Uh, another question coming through here, uh, Rania, we might go to you on this one. We covered a little bit of this off earlier. Um, will the changes to eligibility for mental injuries be applied to existing claims if an IME, for example, finds the mental injury does not meet the new eligi eligibility criteria? So I think that's an existing claim that might not meet that criteria. Is that still going to be eligible to continue, Rania? So um, good question. I think uh, to clarify, it's only new injuries, new mental injuries after the 31st, on or after the 31st of March, that will be subject to the changes. So if you have an existing claim or there was an injury um, prior to the 31st of March, they will not be subject to the new requirements. And Chris, I'll probably just add to that as well from what um, Rania said is it also doesn't apply to secondary mental injuries. So if a work has a physical injury and subsequently develops a secondary mental injury, um, whilst they still need to meet the um, definition of a mental injury, they don't need to meet any other um, eligibility requirements around predominant or around any of those other exclusions. Great. Thanks for jumping in there, Simon. Rania, I might give another one to you now. Um, this is in relation to psychosocial amendments to the OHNS Act. Um, have they been passed or when, they, when might they be coming down the line? So um, I think you're referring to, Chris, the psychological health regulations. Um, there was a public comment period um, a couple of years ago, I think 2022, that we had released a RIS, a regulatory impact statement on the proposed psychological health regulations, and they are currently being considered by government. So in terms of um, have they progressed, they are still um, with government for their consideration. Um, a question here as well um, in relation to how the scheme may work for people that already had a mental illness before the additional increase from work-related issues. I think you covered that off just a little bit earlier, Simon, but just talk us through that, those secondary mental injuries again. Yes, thanks, Chris. Um, so if an injured worker um, has a physical injury and develops a secondary mental injury, then these changes, um, apart from the definition, do not apply. Um, but in relation to workers with pre-existing um, conditions that may have pre-existing um, work-related um, or previous claims, as well as um, pre-existing non-work-related conditions, um, if, if that um, condition is aggravated by employment, so if it's an extended injury in any way, an aggravation or exacerbation, then um, the new criteria in full will apply to those injured workers. So when the new claim is lodged, that claim will be assessed under the new legislation. Question here in relation to pre-existing physical injuries and new mental injuries. Um, and the question is, there was a comment from the panel earlier that the scheme is not meant to address pre-existing mental injuries being exacerbated by work. However, the scheme still addresses exacerbation of pre-existing physical injuries. Uh, why is there a difference there? Um, Rania, is that something you might be able to explain? Yeah, sure. And Simon, jump in if you feel um, you want to add anything. Um, I think to clarify again, the scheme was designed at a time um, when there were more physical injuries. It was designed um, to address physical injuries rather than mental injuries. And so one of the challenges that we've experienced is that um, it's been difficult to draw a connection between employment as the cause of a mental health condition um, and earlier, I think maybe what I mentioned was that um, mental injuries are um, 
do do need to be addressed by the scheme, but we want to great we want to create a greater connection between or, or um, identify that greater connection between employment as the cause and the condition. Um, the exacerbation was covered by Simon earlier in that if there is an exacerbation of an injury, whether it's pre-existing um, or otherwise post 31st of March, if you put in a claim, you've got a, a new mental injury and you put in a claim and then in a, however many months or in whatever time period after that, there is an exacerbation, that that is also still covered by the scheme so long as it meets, so long as it meets the definition and it is predominantly caused by work. So I hope that clarifies, but Simon, jump in if there's anything else you want to add there. Yeah. Probably what I'd add, um, Rania, is uh, if if the worker has a um, compensable mental injury claim and then something happens, um, you know, through their recovery, then that might be an extension of the existing claim and, and that would um, be a continuation. But if it was something that was um, significantly more and there was a, a greater aggravation or exacerbation of that condition, then potentially it would be a new claim that would then need to be assessed um, uh, separately um, and be assessed under the new legislation. So, um, that, so again, there's, there's a couple of different nuances there around um, how that um, condition actually evolves and 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 what that um, aggravation or exacerbation is. Simon, so I might just stay with you there. We're getting a few questions coming through in relation to, to mental injury. Um, can you just run us through the, the provisional payment support again and those supports that are available for people who might not be eligible to submit a claim? Yeah, no worries, Chris. Um, yeah, so I really just want to highlight that these changes in no way impact on um, a worker's entitlement um, to provisional payments. And, and provisional payments initially when set up and, and rolled out was designed to provide support to injured workers um, regardless of liability. So regardless of diagnosis, regardless of causation. So that will continue um, uh, post uh, these changes. Um, and really those, um, you know, what provisional payments does offer is to remove that financial barrier for an injured worker to access um, reasonable medical life treatment, um, as well as um, also get supports and assistance through occupational rehab. Um, and part of that being, you know, one of the biggest services that I touched on earlier was facilitated discussion, which is really um, designed to break down those um, interpersonal barriers um, that may be standing in the way of a worker being able to successfully return to work. I do have a question here asking if we can please post all of the changes so we can visually see them. Just a reminder, uh, there is plenty of information on the WorkSafe website. We'll provide you with those links uh, to the specific page at the end of the webinar. We can go and find much more information than we have given you today. Um, Simon, I think this is a question for you also, if you can cover this one off. Um, the question is, GPs can provide certificates of capacity for mental illness. How can the employer be confident that the diagnosis is accurate? That's a really good question, Chris. Um, so part of the um, changes um, moving forward is uh, we will and, and have engaged with the GP um, fraternity um, really around being clear on a certificate of capacity around DSM and the diagnosis, as well as the significant cognitive dysfunction. Um, really, it's it's up to the agent to be confident and to be, um, uh, be satisfied that a worker has um, a mental injury and the significant cognitive dysfunction, that may be via different means. So it could be via a study of capacity, um, but it also, um, in a lot of instances, will be based on an independent doctor's opinion and an independent psychiatrist's opinion. So um, I think employers really um, just need to work closely with their injured workers, work very closely with their agent um, when that certificate is provided um, and whether it is or isn't a valid diagnosis under DSM um, and then the agent will turn their mind to whether that satisfies or whether um, further clarification is required from the general practitioner or the treating psychiatrist or psychologist or whether an independent opinion is required. I think another one for you, kind of on that topic, but from the other end of the scale, um, can a worker dispute a decision that their mental injury isn't eligible under the changes? Definitely. Um, so the um, a worker has um, uh, the, you know very similar um, entitlements to what they do now in relation to dispute. So a worker can lodge a request with conciliation. Um, a worker can. Um, 
then also go through our internal and independent review service as well. So, so there are a number of different means um, on any of the actual um, changes as well as any of the grounds that a decision is um, made. So whether that is on the diagnosis, whether it's on the significant cognitive dysfunction, or alternatively, whether it's around predominant or any of the, the new exclusion. So um, a, a Wingy worker does um, continue to have rights um, around disputing that decision. Thanks, Simon. Plenty of questions uh, coming through for you. And another one here, I think, we'll throw to you. Um, if a worker attends an IME assessment at the 130-week termination period and the IME determines that their um, whole person impairment or WPI um, is not accessible due to instability, what happens there? That's another really good question, Chris. And, and I think there, there will be um, quite a number of instances where um, the condition hasn't stabilised and, and therefore a proper assessment of the whole person impairment cannot be done. Um, the assessment will still take place in relation to the capacity. Um, so if a worker is determined to be incapacitated indefinitely um, and the whole person impairment has not been um, able to be assessed due to stability, then um, what's called a um, interim decision can be made, which really means that a worker will remain on weekly payments until a point in time where the condition has stabilised and the whole person impairment can be then um, subsequently assessed. Um, so that, that will be something that we will see um, as frequent um, due to um, sometimes um, issues and timeframes associated with stability. Rania, I might come to you now with a question uh, that's getting a few likes. Um, why have psychologists been excluded from diagnosing mental injury? Uh, so currently, a medical practitioner is defined in the workers' compensation legislation and medical practitioner is defined as including general practitioners and psychiatrists. What we know, though, is that in practice, GPs will often refer to a psychologist and um, a psychologist who is trained in um, diagnosing with the DSM is able to then provide a um, diagnosis back to the GP who then will review that and then be able to put forward the formal diagnosis based on the advice of a psychologist. So while they're not necessarily included in the definition of medical practitioner, uh, in practice, what we do know is that GPs will consult with psychologists to come to that um, formal diagnosis. Great. Thanks, Rania. Uh, Simon, coming back to you, um, will GPs be getting additional training to diagnose mental health disorders as outlined in the DSM? Or as Rania said there, do they, do they need to re rely on uh, psychologists to, to help them do that work? Um, so... so GPs we see currently um, have um, on certificates diagnosed under DSM and do provide clear um, um, you know, and valid diagnosis. So that that's that's um, currently that that's sort of occurring. Not in every instance, but you know, in in a number of um, instances that the GP does do that. So, um, but we are and and have um, consulted very closely with um, uh, GPs around. Um, and also updating and planning to update the certificate of capacity, which will call out, um, you know, the diagnosis under DSM as well as the significant cognitive dysfunction. So um, it, it is something that um, we, we do expect that GPs will and, and will continue to diagnose under DSM, um, and we will continue to work with them to ensure that's the case. Thanks, Simon. Jason, got a question for you here. Uh, the research says that workers are significantly more likely to return to work if they are happy in their workplace. Um, is there any work being done in the background to assist employers uh, to make sure they understand their role in return to work? Um, at this point, it seems as though all of the emphasis is on the worker. So what, what are we putting in place to ensure employers understand their rights and responsibilities for returning injured workers to work? Jason? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, so there are a number of things that we're looking at. One of the areas under Return to Work Victoria is about innovations and what are some of the things that we can explore, um, understand more of, um, invest in to help us to work in some of those areas. And there are some um, uh, there are some uh, pilots that are being explored and uh, with a view to being tested around how we can better help uh, support both injured workers but also employers 
um, and helping to guide them towards what is a, a safe workplace and, and a workplace that is uh, conducive, uh, healthy for workers to be able to uh, operate in. Um, we're working closely with our uh, broader colleagues within the um, within our prevention space as well to make sure that we learn and gain as much as we can uh, from this situation. So um, suffice to say that that there is uh, absolutely a lot of work that's being done uh, around some guidelines as well to help support uh, our employers. And Chris, what I'd probably add to that as well is that, um, you know, employers still have their um, return of work obligations within the legislation that hasn't changed. So, you know, we would be expecting and working with employers, as Jason referred to, um, around ensuring that early um, engagement with injured workers um, post the claim being lodged, even prior to or post um, liability determination, to ensure that any possibility of a sustainable return to work is explored. And if an employer does not meet their obligations, then, of course, our return to work inspectorate um, do play an important role in both education, but also in relation to compliance. All right, thanks, Simon. Um, Rania, another question for you in relation to mental injury eligibility. Um, how is it determined whether or not employment is the most significant contributor to a mental injury? Is this determined by medical information or is it determined by the agent? So I I think it's a combination of both and um, Simon again feel free to add in any more to this but in currently in determining oh sorry previously in determining um, or assessing entitlement an agent would look at uh, wh what the cause of the work was I think in the process of a GP or a medical practitioner determining what the cause of the concerns are by the worker they will need to determine what the cause is and similarly, the agent will also look at um, the specifics of the case and um, inquire, ask questions, that kind of thing, um, to determine what the cause was. So it's a combination of both, really. But Simon? Yeah, and, and what I'll add to that, um, Rania and Chris, is really that um, it, it will be a determination made by the independent doctor, but it'll, but it'll be based on um, being informed of um, both clinical information. So again, um, making sure that the agent obtains treater and clinical information that's then provided to the independent doctor, um, as well as factual information. So um, we know that within our circumstantial um, investigation report, there's a number of different statements around what's happening within work, but also sometimes what's happening outside of work. So um, and I think all of those things um, would need to be provided to the independent doctor. And then it becomes an issue of causal weight. So the doctor would then need to assess um, what is going on in, in within work and also what's going on externally and then make that determination as to whether employment is the predominant cause. Thanks, Simon. Uh, Jason, coming back to you now, um, as we've discussed, uh, the government has made these changes to ensure the work cover scheme is sustainable and can continue to support injured workers into the future. We have a question here in relation to premiums. As we know, premiums were raised by the government last year for the, for the first time in, in 20 years. Um, how will these changes affect premiums and can we expect to see premiums rise again, Jason? Thanks, Chris. So those premiums were significant um, increases um, in probably in the scheme's history, and um, they were necessary in order for us to, to bring sustainability back to the scheme. But on top of that, we also have the reforms that have, that have recently been, been passed and, and are being put into operation. Um, and these are the steps that are being taken to help stabilise um, or to get the scheme back into control and to stabilise it. Uh, and so the anticipation would be that we we wouldn't see any significant increases in premiums, um, and that we'd be working hard within uh, within WorkSafe and working with our partners and key stakeholders to make sure that we can um, keep the scheme in a sustainable uh, on a sustainable footing, using our our performance um, and the way in which we manage um, uh, manage the modelling of the scheme as well. So the um, so so the the, the premiums that have the, the significant increases to the premiums that were experienced uh, this this current uh, financial year, um, the the idea is that they have they won't be as significant, um, and that we have now managed to um, gain a footing here that we can keep 
and maintain uh, sustainability or stability within the scheme. Great, thank you, Jason. Um, Simon and Rania, just another question on mental injury eligibility. Um, how will it be assessed or defined what is considered bullying or harassment for eligibility purposes? Rania, I might throw to you first. Yeah, sure. So bullying and harassment, um, bullying is defined under separate legislation, equal opportunity legislation, and WorkSafe for a number of purposes will refer to that definition. Um, I think in practice with harassment, it will be a combination of referring to the same um, legislation in regards to sexual harassment under the equal opportunity legislation. Um, and then obviously when uh, the specifics of the case are presented, that that will obviously be determined against guidance material, um, which is also available on the website. What I add to that as well, Chris, is so currently the um, agents actually do assess um, claims for bullying and harassment, and, and generally that will involve obtaining all the relevant statements and information from both employer, workers and others within the workplace um, and make a determination, not necessarily on whether a person has been bullied as per the occupational health and safety definition, but to actually make a determination as to whether a worker has suffered an injury as a result of what is happening within the workplace. And, and sometimes that might be bullying and harassment behaviours without um, necessarily making definitive determination of bullying or harassment, which um, which is generally something that the agents cannot determine. So, um, so that will continue. Um, and then really these changes are really just more focused on, you know, has employment been that predominant cause and whether that was um, due to um, anything that would be stress or burnout um, as a result of those usual or typical. So um, unlikely that those um, claims, um, if determined, would be impacted by these changes. We might just cover this off again because we're getting a question that's getting quite a few likes. So the question is, how does the scheme work for people that already had mental illness before additional increase from work-related issues? I think we did cover that off before, Rania, but we might just run through that again in terms of uh, a mental injury pre-existing being exacerbated by work-related mm -hmm. issues. Yeah, so if the mental injury and occurred or the incident that caused the mental injury all occurred before the 31st of March, then any exacerbation of an injury that occurred before the 31st of March would not be subject to these changes. The changes will only apply to new injuries, so an injury or an incident that causes um, a condition following the 31st of March as with the exacerbation of that injury that will only um, be subject to the changes after the 31st. And, and probably right. just Thanks, the, the other point, and probably the other point there, um, Chris, is um, this isn't about a worker that actually um, may, you know, have um, or be predisposed, so maybe having, you know, prior mental health concerns, um, you know, uh, this, this, this is about what then happens in the workplace. So employers take an injured worker as they recruit them, and, and sometimes that may be with um, prior, you know, mental health um, concerns and issues that they've experienced. Um, really what we would then be turning to would be what happened within the workplace that's actually resulted in an exacerbation or an aggravation of that um, prior condition and then as to whether employment is the predominant cause of that aggravation. So, you know, it, it won't be um, considering what a person's prior mental health, um, you know, issues or concerns or history is. It's about what happened within the workplace um, that has resulted in that aggravation or exacerbation. Staying with with you now, um, question here, how is the 21%, this is in relation to the whole person impairment, how is the 21% assessed? Um, what makes the difference, for example, between 20% and 21%? A, a very uh, tough question, but um, really, really the independent um, impairment assessors actually do assess um, an injured worker based on guides. So there are actually guides that are very objective guides around a worker's um, you know, condition and in relation to their whole person impairment. Um, and that's both physical and mental injury. So um, the, the independent impairment assessor would then um, go through those guides, understand from a, um, an injured worker as to the symptoms and, and diagnosis, et cetera, and then form a view as to whether that um, is or isn't above or below 21%. 
um, or come up with any um, particular whole person impairment figure. So it is very structured. It is very, um, very much done as it is now. Um, so there are um, certain criteria that they would go through to be able to come up with that ultimate um, assessment of whole person. Thanks, Simon. Um, Randia, just coming back to you in relation to um, mental injury eligibility uh, around that time frame of the 31st of March, um, do the new assessment provisions for a mental health claim apply to a claim which has been lodged after the 31st of March, but relates to an identified injury that happened prior to the 31st of March? Um, so that's a interesting and, and an interesting question and I, I hate to do it to you Simon but I think it's a combination of, of things so um, a claim can be assessed on the injury date and at times based on the complexity of mental injury um, conditions or mental injuries that sometimes other things need to be considered but essentially the, the intention of the reforms is that it's only the injury date post uh, 31st of March that is captured by the changes um, open to you, Simon, if you want to add to any of that. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to add to it. And, and, and I think, you know, further to what um, Rania was referring to, it is date of injuries on or after the 31st of March. And we do know that 90% you know, of mental injury claims that are lodged within the scheme um, are gradual over a period of time. So date of injury sometimes then becomes challenging to determine. Um, you know, there are a small number of or a small percentage of claims that are more acute, which relate to a specific incident, which will be pretty clear um, as to whether it is um, on or after the 31st of March. But in relation to those gradual onsets, then there's a, a determination that the agent will need to make based on all available um, information and evidence to determine as to the exact date of injury. Um, and whether it does or does not fall under the new legislation or not. So um, there is um, a lot of training and a lot of guidance that we have actually tried to provide agents in relation to establishing the date of injury for those um, gradual onset type conditions. Thanks, Simon. I might stick with you for this question. Um, how will agents or self-insurers assess that um, what is usual or typical in a particular workplace, other than taking the word of the employer, for example, um, when assessing these injuries? Yeah, no, a very good question. Um, and and th this is one that um, is very much around the evidence. So, again, everyone's going to have maybe different views and they may be an employer and a injured worker may have slightly different views around what is usual or typical. And, and I use an example of workload. So an injured worker might feel that, you know, the workload is not usual or typical and it's um, significant, you know, significantly increased um, to cause the actual um, mental injury, where an employer might um, really sort of provide feedback along the lines that it's seasonal or it's, you know, it's expected that, you know, um, workload goes up and down based on certain times of the year or different things. So, and I think what's expected at that point is, is the agent and or self-insurer turning their mind to what does the evidence say? So it might be, you know, um, providing some clear information around workload and, and what, you know, whether it's phone phone call volumes, whether it's, you know, any of those sort of things that would need to be um, obtained and provided to, to enable an agent to then determine as to whether it is usual or typical um, or whether it is something that's above and beyond that, that is something that is significant that realistically shouldn't invoke the um, stress or burnout exclusion. So it will be a determination of evidence. Can I just add to that, Simon? Um, I think it's really important to have a consistency in decision making by decision makers, so agents and GPs and others. And that's one of the reasons why WorkSafe released the practice directive, which is on the website. And I think you're going to link to that or provide the link to that later. But that practice directive is aimed at supporting decision makers in determining the various um, uh, and understanding the various criteria that now sits behind entitlement for compensation for mental injury. So that practice directive should support consistency in decision making when it comes to things like usual, or typical um, and reasonably expected to occur at work. Great. Thank you, Rania. Rania, we'll just stick with you for a moment. I think we did cover this one off earlier, but just to ensure the audience is, is completely across it, because we do have another question that's getting a few likes. Um, can we just run through again, what is a medical professional um, who can 
give that diagnosis. Um, GP, psychologist, psychiatrist, can you just run us through that again? Yep. So medical professional under the workers' compensation legislation includes GPs and psychiatrists. So the person who is filling out the certificate of capacity providing the medical certificate will need to be the GP or the psychiatrist. But what we know is that in practice, GPs will often refer a worker through to a psychologist for treatment and support. And, the, and some psychologists, clinical psychologists, are trained in diagnosing in the DSM. And so they might then provide a diagnosis for the worker refer them back to the GP or provide a certificate back to the GP for the GP's consideration, who will then need to then fill out the um, certificate of capacity and support the claims process. Excellent. Thanks, Rania. I'll stick with you for this one, just in relation to what we spoke about earlier and traumatic events in a workplace. Um, does that have to be a single incident or can it be an accumulation of traumatic events over, over time as part of the course of, of employment? Yeah, so definitely it can be cumulative or single. I think um, the example of uh, an essential service worker or a frontline worker is, is a good one in this circumstance where we're talking about people who are regularly exposed to emotionally shocking incidents or things that can be quite upsetting. And over a period of time, it could be months or years, that that then results in some degree of trauma. So that's cumulative trauma. Uh, and that is captured uh, to, or that is going to continue to be eligible should they meet the definition of mental injury. And if it's a one-off incident, um, for example, a, a witnessing a car accident or, or attending a car accident that was so severe that that caused uh, a con mental health condition, that that would also still remain compensable. So it's both. Great. Thanks, Rania. Um, we've got a couple of questions there still that I think we've we've covered off already. One that did just pop up very briefly there, Jason, I might throw to you. This is in relation to WorkSafe's Return to Work Inspectorate. Is that going to be part of Return to Work Victoria? And will we, will we still be um, sending inspectors out to ensure employers are fulfilling their obligations in trying to get injured workers back to work as soon as possible? Thanks, Chris. So probably the second half of your question, yes, we will still continue with um, return to work inspectors going out um, to the first part. Uh, no, at this stage, they're not considered to be, um, be, be part of return to work Victoria. Uh, we'll continue to work where they are under the health safety business unit here at, at WorkSafe. Um, but we'll have close collaboration with Return to Work Victoria and making sure that learnings and understanding and awareness continues to be a key part of uh, what drives the work and the guidance there. Excellent. Thank you, Jason. Well, that is just about all the questions we do have time for in today's session. So thank you for everyone for sending them through. And remember, if you don't think we answered your question or if it's still up on the screen, we will attempt to answer those questions and put the answers up on the website. We're going to give you a link to all of the information where you can follow it through and get everything you need very shortly. But before we wrap up today, just a final question for the panel. Um, what are your key points you'd like the audience to take? away from today. Rania, we might start with you. Thanks, Chris. Um, I guess if, if work is impacting your mental health, then accessing support early is, is critical. And um, all workers who uh, submit a claim for a mental injury are also eligible to receive uh, 13 weeks of provisional payments for mental health treatment and support services, even if their claim is rejected. Thank you, Rania. Simon, last word. Yeah, probably uh, a couple of points I'd probably just want to leave the audience with is, you know, not all workers are impacted by these changes. So um, as Rania um, pointed out earlier, it's around mental injury claims that are actually, or um, date of injury of mental injury claims on or after the 31st of March, as well as the additional whole person impairment requirement will only be on those um, injured workers that reach 130 weeks on or after the 31st of March. But, but with both of those areas as well is if an injured worker is impacted, um, WorkSafe um, has a number of, um, uh, you know, uh, services like provisional payments that, that Rani had touched on for um, mental injury claims, as well as um, WorkSafe or, our, or their agent will contact them if they're impacted by the whole person, change at 130 weeks um, and, and really support them and guide them through the next steps. Thank you, Simon. And Jason, just some final thoughts from you. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, I probably just want to reiterate the importance um, of these changes 
to the scheme in order to ensure that the scheme remains sustainable and can be around uh, to support Victorians both now and into the future. Um, the role of return to work is, is absolutely pivotal uh, to the recovery journey, um, help, helping to improve uh, outcomes for, for our injured workers. Um, and the research is conclusive that the sooner an injured worker um, has returned to work and is off the scheme, the better their prospects are for a more durable recovery. So uh, Return to Work Victoria is, is our priority uh, uh, to, to serve the government and to, in order to serve the, the injured workers and help them recover, um, to get back to work and to get back to work safely um, and without delay. Thanks, Jason. And thank you to all three of you for being available to answer questions and be on today's panel. And we hope you in the audience have found this an interesting and informative session. Remember, WorkSafe's website is the central point for further information on these changes to modernise the work cover scheme. And you can visit www.worksafe.vic.gov.au forward slash scheme dash modernisation for further information, including those information sheets and guidance for decision makers that we spoke about earlier. And we'll try to answer any of your questions that we didn't get to today on that link as well. This webinar will also be available on online via the website soon and we'll note on the screen shortly some additional contact details you may find helpful if you have any requests for further information or further questions we recommend you get in touch thanks for watching